growing canola is a very challenging task. We've put together a short video that will help you identify some of the more common pests, how to identify economic thresholds, and best management practices in controlling them while protecting their beneficial cousins. Some bugs that you don't want in your canola include cabbage seed pod weevil, ligus, diamondback moth, and cutworms. The first thing you need to know is what bugs might be in your crop. You can find out about some of these by sweeping a flowering crop. It takes a little practice and technique to it. We'll show you that in a second. The main goal in sweeping your crop is to find out what kinds of pests are present and how many of the little blighters are eating your crop. It's important to master the sweeping technique. If you're not sweeping in the correct way, you won't have accurate results as Scott Mears demonstrates. Left hip to right hip. The sweep is a moving sweep, so you're walking as you go, okay? The sweep is meant to be in fresh material each time you go through the, through the crop. Think about the general principle. It's you're meant to be moving, you're meant to get into fresh material each time, and you're meant to have that full 180 degrees. That's what the thresholds are based on. If you're sweeping for cabbage seed pod weevil, you want the top of the net right level with the top of the flowers, okay? Because you're just knocking them off the flowers. If you're sweeping for ligus, first of all, you're sweeping at the end of flower and it's tougher to do, but you want about three quarters of the net in the crop if you can. But basically as much of the net up to three quarters. And the reason for that is ligus fly away, especially on a warm day like we're going to have later today. They'll, they'll fly away. So. You want, you want some room for them to fly up and then you catch them in the net. If you're having troubles counting them in the field, simple Ziploc bag, label your bag and count it back at, the, back at your, your shop, your office, whatever. Um, you can freeze these guys and then they don't move so much, right? <laughs> in this unsprayed field, we did 10 sweeps and can easily see we're way over the count threshold. Just as an example, we went back and did only two sweeps and counted 40. 40 cabbage seed pod weevils. Do your 10 sweeps and then count what you have. Sweep in at least five spots along the field edge. If you have more than two per sweep, move further into the field, 150 feet or so, and try sampling again. Weevils collect in large numbers along the field edges and they spread out into the field. You may find that further into the field, the numbers decrease below the threshold. If the field has variable maturity, sweep randomly throughout the field and not just in the areas that are flowering. Whenever we talk a threshold, you also have to consider the time or the, the uh, stage of the crop. If it's the wrong time in the crop for, the, for, for, uh, for, for damage, the, the threshold doesn't mean anything. Same thing with cabbage seed pod weevil. Same thing with ligus, okay? In fact, the ligus threshold changes as the crop matures. So crop stage and, and your numbers properly assessed, that's how you get to your thresholds. For cabbage seed pod weevil, spraying should be done at about 20% bloom. The weevils start to lay their eggs when the pods are about an inch long, so timing is important. Spraying too early will be of no benefit. Check the Farming Smarter or Alberta Canola Producers Commission website for the latest information on cabbage seed pod weevil control. Begin scouting fields for ligus on sunny, dry days with temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius. Start when the plants are at the bud stage and continue until the seeds are firm within the pods. The Canola Council recommends sampling in 14 locations. Their website has an economic threshold table you can use to determine whether a treatment is required. Pheromone traps can be used to obtain early warning of possible diamondback moth infestations. Environmental conditions will determine how many eggs are laid and whether the larvae emerge and survive. With a heavy rainfall, larvae are washed to the ground where they can be eaten by beetles or spider predators. Scouting means removing plants from a square foot area and beating them on a clean surface to shake the larva from the plants. Repeat this in five locations at least twice a week during the growing season. 
The economic threshold for diamondback moths in canola at the advanced pod stage is 20 to 30 larvae per square foot, or 2 to 3 larvae per plant. The Western Forum on Pest Management website states the following economic thresholds for diamondback moth. If you're seeing more than 25% defoliation on a seedling plant, you're likely above the economic threshold. If you're seeing around 10 to 15 larvae per square foot on an immature or flowering plant, it will require a treatment. If you're seeing more than 20 to 30 larvae per square foot on a plant that's flowering and has pods, you've exceeded your economic threshold. An economic threshold for canola or mustard in the early flowering stage has not yet been established. However, at this plant growth stage, insecticide applications are likely required at larval densities of 10 to 15 per square foot, or one or two per plant. Scout your fields and inspect seedlings on a weekly basis from mid-May to mid-June. Determine whether the bare areas with no seedlings have resulted from poor germination or from cutworm damage. Check the edges of bare areas for cutoff plants and search the top two inches of the soil around those plants for larvae. The key to control is detection. When notched, wilted or dead cutoff plants are found, dig around the roots of these plants looking for cutworms. The damage they do we typically think of as cutoff plants. So they're living down in the soil. Most of them are actually above ground feeders. So they come just above the soil, and they nip off the plant. In the case of canola, that's instant death. That plant is done. When canola gets this big, usually cutworms are done for the season. Once it gets to sort of the five leaf stage, the stem of canola is too big and too woody for that cutworm to really be cutting right through. Often what they'll do, because most of them are above ground feeders anyway, they'll climb up to the nearest leaf petiole where it connects to the stem and they'll clip that because that's still soft. So on larger canola plants, you'll see just wilted leaves laying around the plant instead of the whole plant wilting. And obviously if there's some wind, then you're not gonna notice that later damage because those wilted leaves are just gonna blow away. Um, but you're looking for wilted leaves in larger plants. Cutworm control may only be necessary in small areas of the field where bare patches appear and large numbers of cutworms are still actively feeding. Canola is much more susceptible to cutworm damage than cereals because no regeneration or tillering occurs to compensate for the loss of the plant. Use an insecticide when you find more than three or four cutworms per square yard. If your economic threshold calculations determine that spraying is required, please follow general guidelines for insecticide applications. Follow all label directions, wear the appropriate safety gear, and please consider the environment. Spraying during the peak sunshine times of the day can harm the beneficial insects such as bees. Please avoid spraying during those hours. Also note that some cabbage seed pod weevil registered products are synthetic pyrethroids and can lose efficacy at higher temperatures during the day. In every farm, you are going to find lots of beneficial arthropods uh, in your field. And these arthropods, like the spiders, the roll beetles, and you will see specimens. I have a drawer with specimens. Uh, we may have a few in the pitfall trap. But all these uh, arthropods are very active, working for you free. They never send you a bill in the mail. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're always doing their work for you. And what, and what they do, is they're actually patrolling the ground uh, at all times and there are uh, specialized species that uh, work during the day uh, there are others that work at night and they're eating whatever they can get sometimes they eat each other also so it happens that there are many karabi beetles these ground dwelling arthropods that are actually feeding on the eggs so a lot of the eggs that are laid by a pest are actually consumed by these beneficial insects same thing happens with root maggots you know, root maggots lay lots of eggs at the base of canola plants 
A lot of those eggs don't actually make it. They actually become food for these carabi beetles. There's quite a few species of, uh, of these beneficial arthropods. Uh, if you actually were able to sample all of them that you have in your farm, you probably would find something like 200 uh, species of uh, including spiders, daddy long legs, carabi beetles, uh, staphylinid beetles, these row beetles. Uh, there will be other, other uh, less abundant, but those would be the more, even ants also, they actually have a, a, a predation role that they will, they will feed and attack uh, pests, they will carry caterpillars into their nest. So it's quite a few different species. These beetles are the ones that we actually don't acknowledge as much or the uh, spiders, because each, each one, each species on its own will not control a pest because they actually eat on everything. They're generalist. However, if you start adding the effects of all of these species, uh, remember we have about, you probably have a hundred species in your farm. If you start adding the uh, cumulative effects of all of these species, the spiders, the uh, daddy long legs, the ground beetles, the row beetles, then those start to, to, uh, to add up. Reduced tillage helps to increase the amount of residue and organic matter in a field. This in turn will allow the development of a more complex food web. There will be more animals, like springtail insects and earthworms, feeding at the base of the food web. This allows for more predators to come to the field and strengthen the army of beneficials available to combat potential pests. As you can see, it's important in order to manage canola pests properly to first of all be able to effectively identify the pest, to understand the economic thresholds so that you can apply appropriate control methods while preserving that important army of beneficial insects. This video is just an outline of some of the major canola pests and beneficials that may live in your canola crop. More information can be found at the following websites.